Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm your host D-Day and today I'll be bringing you episode 10 of A Day with D-Day. So today's episode is going to cover years 2015 to 2017. So I did mention uh, last time that I was considering this period to be the beginning of the dark night of the soul, which everything that I'm talking about recently all of the weird terms and stuff are all spiritual terms. So uh, what I did also realize is that uh, during this time period, that uh, what, what, what I was going through was also forcing me to begin my shadow work. So uh, I'm learning all of these new terms and, uh, you know, trying to find a, a good path to take into the future spiritually. And I'm realizing that uh, like, I'm not starting at step number one. Like I kind of without guidance started this entire journey. So I have to figure out what I've already done. <laughs> so the dark night of the soul and shadow work for this episode. And then, uh, Again, I need to stress that this series is about myself and only myself, uh, that the series is only about me. Uh, also, the series will not be for children. Uh, it will both be unedited and raw. So if I make a mistake or if I cuss by accident or if I uh, have an emotional response, I'm not going to stop the file, delete it and start over. So, you know, it doesn't include these things. Because uh, like I have always said that being genuine is, and, and me feeling like I'm, I'm going to be understood properly is more important than making the perfect YouTube video. So uh, if you have a problem with unedited YouTube videos or uh, profanity or uh, emotional content, then this series might not be what you're looking for. Uh, but I do want to state that uh, I have a very good feeling that uh, I have a microphone in mind for this weekend. So Minecraft is almost here, guys. And uh, my primary goal uh, for this video and for the series as a whole is to promote awareness of oneself and for me to have an opportunity to express gratitude and fully synchronize myself to the positive person that I wish to become. So I really hope that this video and the upcoming series helps you as well. Uh, if you could show your support, please hit the like button in the bottom right. Please click subscribe and hit the bell to be notified for future content. And then also uh, consider leaving a comment. I would love to hear your opinions and your experiences. Uh, any kind of constructive criticism as well, or if you want to drop in what your favorite Disney movie is, for example. I'd love to talk to you about anything. So the uh, offer to join the Discord is also still there. Just click the Discord button in the banner in the top right of the YouTube page and uh, to be completely transparent. All of these free things like uh, hitting the like button, subscribe, the bell, uh, going to Discord, joining the Discord family, uh, shares, comments, all of that stuff triggers the YouTube algorithm to make this video and the series and the channel more visible on YouTube as a platform. So if you want to help our channel grow and succeed, then uh, those are the free tools for you and I encourage you and I already thank you in advance just for being here. Thank you. So if you are ready, here is episode 10 of A Day with D-Day. So the beginning of this episode, of course, is going to be a little sad and a little serious. You know, I'm not being dramatic. This is how I actually felt back then. So 2015 was a very, very terrible moment for me in 2015. I lost the most important person to me in my entire life. Um, my, my reason uh, for existence, really, you know, my firstborn daughter. 
and I've been thinking about making a completely full explanation of everything that happened and uh, just like the abuse episode upload my entire story onto YouTube and have it scheduled for next year you know that is my dead man switch if anything happens to me or to the my ability to access the account or anything like that then my story will be revealed unless I push that date back manually so uh, so yeah I lost my firstborn daughter and it emotionally ruined me and completely honest I'm not being melodramatic I secretly set out to kill myself uh, in 2015 and uh, I could not get the option of uh, suicide out of my head um, and honestly it did not come from a place of being depressed it came from a place of my emotional pain was so unbearable and unrelenting that I thought the only way I could make it stop is if I made that final choice, you know? So, uh, I mean, from every rooftop that I stood and I looked over the edge, uh, every, every bridge in my nature trail that I went under, you know, you know, like, uh, I started thinking about every single movie that I had seen, every single option of how to do it. And uh, I slowly started seriously working towards hiding it as an accident so that it did not uh, hurt people that I was leaving behind. To me, it felt like uh, I was trying to justify it that uh, if I went out looking like an accident, people could handle that better than if it was just straight up suicide. Because, you know, like I, I loved everyone around me, you know, my mom and my dad, and uh, I didn't want to hurt them, but I couldn't live without my firstborn daughter. The pain was unbelievable. Like she was, the sole reason why I got out of bed in the morning, you know, for the past six years, she was my reason to exist. And so, you know, I, I suffered incredible emotional pain every single waking moment of my life. And I could default, it felt like I defaulted to one directive and that was survive until tomorrow and I did that for a very long time just survive until tomorrow and I eventually I got to a point where I chose my mind chose to move on from her and I defaulted back to my original plan that I wanted to set into motion uh, after my relationship with C ended and before I got into a relationship with S. I wanted to go back to that possibility of that future because that was uh, my, my shining light that I wanted to work towards, you know, where I could do whatever I wanted, you know, whenever I wanted. I was free to be the real me, you know, to be happy, to be excited about things, you know, not waste any more time uh, being things or doing things, you know, so that people will like me. And uh, I wanted to pretend like nothing ever happened. And I wanted to pretend like she never existed. And it was at this moment in my life that I tossed myself completely into college and I graduated college. Uh, I gave up on my stupid primary purpose of finding a soulmate. 
This was, of course, I'm being fully programmed by college on how to think. And I was like, soulmates is a stupid concept. I'm being a child. I need to quit. Quit being a kid. This is why you're in uh, this shit show right now is because you were being a romantic. You know, you need to grow up. I was really hard on myself. And uh, I focused on, you know, I'm going to make money now. And I'm going to be successful. And I'm going to stand on my own two feet. I don't need anyone. I'm going to take care of myself. I got serious, or so I thought, you know. And uh, my best friend at the time was O. And he and I had anime in common, which uh, anime... I could, I could probably do an entire series just on anime, so I'll just leave it on that. Anime, dot, dot, dot. I loved going out with him, you know, and eating junk food, you know, like uh, fast food, and watching anime, and uh, it felt like I was back in my high school years, you know, spending time with R. That was my nostalgia, you know? But... I wasn't wasting my life, you know? Uh, I was ambitious. I had a lot of ambition. I didn't want to only graduate from college, you know? I, uh, I wanted to go to graduate school. You know, I had full plan, everything set out to go to grad school. And I didn't just want a master's degree, I wanted a PhD, you know? And I knew at the time that uh, opportunities, there's more opportunities for people with master's degrees than people with PhDs. The uh, amount you get paid really isn't that big. Uh, it, well, it is, you know, but it's kind of like when you get a PhD, you disqualify yourself from all of the positions where people are just looking for someone with a master's degree. They don't want to, you're overqualifying yourself for everything. So I didn't care because I wanted the PhD for myself. I wanted to prove it to myself. And uh, I mean, not even that, I didn't just want a PhD, you know? I wanted to move back to Germany and I wanted to earn a PhD in cognitive neuroscience from Humboldt, the university in Berlin, you know? What up? That's how ambitious I was. And uh, I look back now and I knew back then, you know, was I being delusional, you know, or manic, you know? Uh, no. Absolutely not. I, I was at the time, and I still am right now, completely capable of doing this for myself. I know that for a fact, you know? Uh, and I'd like to joke that this isn't even my final form, right? And uh, at that time, I really felt like I was stepping into my power. I really was. O and I, we shared a hobby, you know, together that meant so much to me involving anime. And it was cosplay, which is dressing up as anime characters. So we dressed up as our favorite anime characters. And I was pretty proud of myself because I do have a very strong artistic talent as well. Not just uh, math and sciences, but also arts. Like I, I'm, I'm pretty talented in both, you know, without being arrogant. Like that's me being confident. I'm good at it. And... Uh, I didn't just buy a costume and put it on and wear it all sloppy and stuff like that. Uh, you know, like a party city costume and then walk around, you know, that wasn't good enough for me. I wanted to express myself. I wanted to represent myself, you know, as uh, with, with what I truly am, you know, like uh, I, uh, I wanted everything to be exact, you know, like, so I got my, my cosplays fitted, I got, I replaced pieces of it that I didn't think were good enough, you know? I added minor things like uh, specific pockets and specific uh, bracelets and everything. I was super down into the details kind of guy. And one example was uh, I made a full-on Lord Conti cosplay from my favorite anime, Fully Coolie, FLCL. I recreated a Lord Conti cosplay that I can wear that looks absolutely amazing. I'm happy with it. It's one of my masterpieces. And just to put it into perspective, I repainted that cosplay from the ground up over six times. I'm not even exaggerating. And it was rough because the color of his armor 
is a bluish green, which is also a running joke. You know, is this blue or is this green? I tend to push everything towards green. <laughs> and uh, it, it was rough because in some, in some of the episodes, there's only six, depending on how the light in the episode hits his armor. He's more blue sometimes, he's more green sometimes. So I did settle on uh, like a mint, very mint kind of green. And then I did accent colors with a bluish kind of turquoise. So I never said it out loud, but that I, I did compromise between blue and green. <laughs> My pride got in the way. And uh, it was around this time too that O started to go to Renfest with me. And I'm so glad I can finally talk about Renfest because Renfest is one of the core pillars that makes me who I am. It really is. And I had been going to the Texas Renaissance Fair, Renfest, since 2011. So I haven't mentioned it until now because uh, it's relevant now. But Fairy Weekend, that's the specific theme. Fairy Weekend Saturday, I went every single year. That was my day, you know, since 2011. And uh, oh, and I, me, we started to camp because you can go camping there on the campgrounds for the entire weekend. And oh, took me camping. And it was my first time camping at an entire Renfest weekend. Uh, you know, going Friday, setting up the tents, setting up the fire, you know, grilling over a real fire, fold out tent, you know, fold out chairs, beers like crazy, you know, and then you have nothing to do but uh, eat your hot dog and just keep on drinking beers and just chill in nature. It's, it's amazing. It is utterly amazing connecting with nature like that. It sounds boring as hell. And that's probably what I thought before I was put in that situation, but it is, oh, it, it's, it's, my, it's my safe space, you know, in my heart, really. And uh, yeah, this, this was my first time experiencing camping at Renfest. So I experienced so many amazing things uh, during campgrounds because uh, it's kind of like a hush-hush, you know, we police ourselves kind of situation. There are no police out in the middle of nowhere. You know, everybody's camping, everybody's, you know, there's a, there's a family section and there's an adult section. And I found a place where people were being their true selves. No masks, no bullshit, no this is how you're supposed to act, you know, without fear of repercussions, people were being themselves. And it pushed me to, it pushed me again, you know, to stop holding myself back from who I really was. Because now I'm seeing all of these people, you know, I'm not the only one that is masking, you know, to a certain degree. And I really wanted to stop being afraid, you know? So this was an amazing experience. And, uh, you know, speaking, this is gonna be tough. Speaking of not being afraid, I did uh, want to say that uh, I will be camping Fairy Weekend Renfest by myself this year. And I've finally accepted that um, I'm not going to replace the friends that I lost either. You know, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be honest with my feelings. I am absolutely terrified of doing this completely by myself, being alone. But I have fully understood now my feelings, especially now in August, that, uh, you know, not, not only losing my twin flame, the, the friends and the family that I lost, they are irreplaceable to me as well. And I could, I could take the easy way out 
and I could never go to RenFest ever again. I thought about it out of fear, you know, but uh, I'm trying to push myself through. I am going to take the hard way, the hard route, the hard way. And I am instead going to fully open my heart and be fully vulnerable. So like, I'm gonna have my tent, I'm gonna have my fire, I'm gonna have my chairs. Yeah. I'll talk about it again, uh, probably in a, in a monthly update. You know, when it, when it gets closer to the season, when it becomes relevant. So I'll go back to my story. I'll go back to the story for now. Um, I tossed myself completely into dating during this period, you know, and I wasn't looking for a soulmate because I was doing the whole, you know, screw it. I'm just gonna find somebody that uh, I wanna spend time with right now, you know? And uh, like, I really thought I was throwing myself into finding myself, you know? So I dated, I dated a lot, a lot of people, you know? And at the beginning I was like, yeah. <laughs> and then the more I did, I was like, no. But, uh, I mean, I, I, turned, I turned me, D-Day, up to 100%, you know, and I was being my true self. And in a way, it obliterated relationship after relationship. It really did. And uh, most of the relationships, if not all of them, uh, the girl left me within the week. That's how unbearable I was. <laughs> and I didn't care, you know, I didn't give a shit. Uh, like I really felt like I was a Renfest bonfire because at Renfest, the campgrounds, there'd be one singular meeting place where they had a huge bonfire and people would dance around the fire and bang drums and do all these like pagan rituals and stuff. It's just, my heart goes to Renfest. I, I, I wish I could live in Renfest permanently. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, like, uh, I was a Renfest bonfire at the very beginning. And, uh, like, the people that I was meeting, they loved it. They loved how enthusiastic I was, how much energy I had. But none of them could, could hang, you know? Because uh, I wouldn't compromise at all, you know, and I wasn't settling at all. I'm, it's like, as soon as I hit a deal breaker, no, I'm not compromising, you know? And uh, it was around this time that uh, one of the girls that I was dating, she introduced me to Hannibal, and I gave it a half-ass watch, and then I, I bought them on Blu-ray, and I re-watched them with O, because I wanted to share it with him, which now I know Gift giving is my love language. And sharing an experience, like I watched this good show, let me share it with you. I am gifting the experience because I already know it's good, you know, so I'm gifting it. So, and I learned that in my last relationship. And, you know, watching this show, it made me realize that inside, you know, inside of me, I was a good person. You know, not that hypocritical bullshit that you hear people say that makes people very sarcastic, you know, and cynical. I'm a cynical and sarcastic person when I hear people go, I'm a good person, you know. But I really mean that, like, I looked inside and I realized that I was a good person. And I was taken advantage of, you know, by a, a very, very bad person. And it darkened me. That's what Hannibal taught me, you know? But I was good inside. I mean, I wasn't my best at this time and afterwards, but I was on my way back to who I was before I met her, you know? And I was healing, you know? I was healing from that. But I wasn't healing as fast as I could have uh, you know, I had a hole in my heart from where my firstborn daughter 
where she was supposed to be. And it, it hurt me every single day, even though I was distracting myself with adventure and excitement, you know? It hurt me every single day. And some days I would feel myself take a couple of steps backwards, you know? I would make mistakes. Sometimes I made mistakes on purpose just to punish myself, you know? And I did my best to move forward, you know, finding myself, trying to find me. So let me jump back to 2015, you know, the beginning of 2015. I like the story a lot. I finished my last class of college and I wanted to graduate and uh, I couldn't graduate because I forgot to hit this stupid check mark box on the internet website for my college. And on the website, you have to go to this specific page and there's a very small box that is a check mark box. You click on it and you click apply for graduation. And because I didn't click that stupid button, I did not graduate in 2015. I had to wait an extra semester. And I like to joke that for someone as intelligent as I am, I'm not very smart. <laughs> Uh, so I had to select next semester 2016 and I was so mad at myself because now my class ring was not going to be divisible by five, you know? I wanted 2015 on my ring and, because that's such an amazing number, you know? And now it's going to have 2016 on it because I didn't hit that button. And, uh... Like I became okay with it because 16 is four by four. I became okay with it. Now I prefer the 16 over the 15. But uh, I also realized that I had to buy tickets to my own graduation. And I was like, this is gonna cost me money? Are you serious? You know? And I had two choices for buying tickets. And uh, like one was the graduation where everyone walks across the stage one at a time, and the other one is where entire sections stand up at the same time and all graduate at the same time. And I knew me, I wanted to walk across the stage because I knew that, dude, I pretty much did this for my parents, you know, and I'm not going to not give them the memory of me walking across the stage you know, or take pictures or something like that, you know, like I was going to do that. So I bought the tickets because to me, I didn't even, I didn't even care about graduating college or getting the piece of paper, the diploma. I didn't care, you know, it's, I did this, I finished it good, you know. And uh, so I selected that I wanted, I wanted the tickets. I had to buy the tickets for walking across the stage. So uh, I, I did uh, bogus classes, you know, just to fill my time for that semester that I had to wait to graduate. And closer to graduation date, I realized that I bought tickets to the wrong one. So uh, I think the choices were graduation ceremony and graduation commencement or something like that. And I bought the tickets to the wrong one. So I was like, I couldn't buy tickets to the one I wanted or refund the ones I had. So I was like, fine, I'll go to this one. And so like graduation happens, it's raining like crazy. And uh, I'm, I'm waiting with all of the other uh, graduates. We're all standing around in our cap and gown in a giant hall waiting to be funneled into the main stadium because all of the guests get to go in and sit down first. And uh, I'm standing there. I don't know anyone because, you know, all of the, the my classmates, we don't all graduate at the same time. Like everyone graduates differently. Like you don't have to be a uh, graduating next semester to take this class. Like people can take whatever classes of the last 14, I think. You can take them in any order, you know? So I didn't know anybody who was graduating with me. I was the only one that was graduating. So I didn't know anybody. So I'm waiting there in a giant hall 
you know, and didn't know anyone and I was alone, but I was fine because my parents and my family were waiting for me in the stadium. And I was really excited to get this over with because we were going to go eat uh, Mexican food. I was gonna get my beef fajitas for one. <laughs> I was excited and I was hungry. You know, I wanted my beef fajitas for one. And it, yeah, it was raining really hard and there was a gap between where we were and going to the stadium. So they gave us these goofy plastic ponchos to wear and uh, they tried to get us to form lines, but the line would stop you know, in between the gap and it would rain on people. So the line pretty much went to shit and people would just cross whenever there was room, you know? And uh, there, I mean, there was a small gap. So I, I abandoned the line. I ran across and went under, under an awning, you know, to keep myself from getting rained on. And I stood there for a while because I was like hesitating to get back into the herd and I finally got back in line, and at this point, it was not a line anymore. It was just a mass of people walking towards the stadium, you know, just... And, uh, <laughs> yeah, like, when we got to the doors, there was alumni were standing at the doors, and they started telling people, you know, go in one at a time. We're forming one, one line now. So when we walked in, we all walked in as one line. We just all kind of smooshed and walked in a straight line. And they made us snake through the chairs from the back end first. So, I mean, like hundreds of chairs. Like I follow, we followed the straight line through the chairs, snaking through. Like I felt like a complete fool, you know? And we must have gone through at least, like I'm not even exaggerating, like a thousand chairs because the full stadium was graduating, right? And then when we finally settled into our whatever, where we're going to sit down, uh, we stood there, we looked forward, the guy up front said to sit down, so we sat down. Then we did stuff where we were required to stand up and I guess sing. I didn't even know that I was required to sing an anthem or something like that. And it was awkward and I just wanted this to be over with because I wanted beef fajitas. But yeah, like uh, we finally got to the point where we were graduating and I was really hungry. And I was also starting to get worried that the restaurant was gonna close. So I was getting really nervous. And I looked down at the floor <clears throat> and in front of me, I saw the calf of the girl that was pretty much you know, sitting in front of me. And I, I could not believe it. I absolutely could not believe it. Uh, I recognized the tattoo on her calf, like sh a full, full tattoo on her calf. And I looked up and I couldn't believe it. And we all did our stand up cheer. I didn't throw my hat because I wanted to keep it, but she turned just a little bit, you know? And I'm not even exaggerating. One seat in front of me and one seat to my left, standing in front of me was Kay. I couldn't believe it, you know? We, I graduated from high school in 2002, right? Kay, she was two to three years younger than I was. 14 years later, after everything I had been through, you know, I missed clicking the button online. I got tickets to the wrong ceremony, you know? I had no contact with her for seven straight years, you know? And then we literally got shuffled, you know, shuffled around and, and with no order to our seating or anything like that, all of this chaos, and she ends up being right in front of me, you know, during one of the most important moments in both of our lives. And uh, I froze. I couldn't, I was like, I started thinking, it's not possible, I'm probably, this isn't her, and I'm probably just, you know, it might not be her because it's just so improbable, right? So I could not speak, I actually could not speak, I couldn't say anything, and I remember just looking at her and just hoping with my entire heart that she would look at me 
and that she would recognize me and that she would talk to me first, you know? And that it didn't happen. And we graduated and I, walk, I watched her walk away out of sight. <laughs> and then afterwards I was, I felt so defeated, you know, that I walked straight up to my mom and I told her, Kay was here. Kay was right in front of me and we both graduated college. She was right in front of me and I couldn't say anything at all. I told my mom and I was devastated. <laughs> and at that moment, like I was really, I seriously started considering Kay to be the soulmate that I've been looking for my entire life and that I lost my chance. And uh, I thought back to how she had been with me the longest in my life, right? And that she always showed up when I needed her the most, you know, and she left when I didn't need her anymore, when I was good, when I was okay again, you know, and that I was never angry with her or upset, you know, when she left. I knew in my heart that I loved her. You know, and I felt like I blew it. I hadn't seen or heard from her in seven years, you know? So I kind of left defeated even though I got my beefitas. <laughs> and I continued to date people and tried to figure out my future. I went back to, okay, let me keep learning about myself then. And uh, a couple of months pass and uh, I decided to randomly go outside, you know, because I was playing Pokemon Go. I started Pokemon Go in, I think, 2016. And uh, I went to go swipe the Pokestop in my neighborhood, just out of nowhere, right? And I took three steps out of my front door with my head down, looking into my phone, and I heard somebody from across the street call my name. So I look up, and there she was. Kay was there on her bike. And standing there, yeah, on her bike, she, she told me that she had been riding to my bike, uh, to my bike, riding to my house every day and stopping and looking at it, right? And I didn't think that was weird at all because uh, I guess, because I'm a weird person anyway, so uh, most people would think that's creepy or that's stalker mentality, you know, but I don't see stuff like that. Uh, to me, that meant she cared, you know? That meant I mattered. And that's, I mean, that's why, that's why it was so hard for me to not stand outside the window with the boombox, like I said in one of my channel updates. Because it's expression, you know? And everyone in the comments told me, good job, D-Day. You know, you didn't do the creepy stalker thing. You understand boundaries, you did the right thing, you know? But my what my heart felt? No, God no, you know? My mind was agreeing, you know, don't be, don't be creepy stalker guy, you know? But my heart, my heart wanted me to do everything that was humanly possible, you know, to show my feelings, you know? And my, my heart, was also telling me that if she truly understood me and I don't do these things, you know, she will think that I don't care, you know, that she doesn't matter to me, that she doesn't actually know me if I do something unpredictable, you know, and that in turn would make her think that breaking up was the correct decision. You know, so what do I do? <sighs> Torn between my mind and my heart, what do I do? And like, I, I, I also got stuck on, you know, more importantly, she left me, why am I still afraid of losing her? Like, what, what's wrong with me? <laughs> why am I still afraid of losing her, you know? Tangent, sorry. Uh, 
where was I? My bullet points. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah, K, K and I, we started talking again, and uh, we went out to eat at IHOP, and it's kind of irrelevant, but it's kind of funny. Oh, he was there on a date, and I was like, dude, it's K, because <laughs> yeah, like I was over at his place you know, all the time. And of course I was, I talked about Kay and how I thought she was my soulmate and how I thought I blew it and all that stuff, you know? So uh, after we had our date at IHOP, we, we went back to her apartment complex and we decided to go swimming in, in her apartment complex. So, and we swam around, uh, you know, until the sun went down, it was pretty cool. And uh, I just started talking and talking and talking. I just wouldn't shut up because, you know, I guess when I'm excited, I talk more than normal. If you can notice, I'm more excited today. <laughs> uh, and I told her everything that I had been through, you know? I told her about my past and I told her about how happy I was that I was swimming with her in the pool. And then it hit me, you know? And uh, maybe it hit you guys, you know, if you're really following along this, what I'm telling, you know, every episode and you care, you know. But I realized that I was inside my dream that I had, my lucid dream. And this time it wasn't a dream. You know, this time it was my present. And uh, getting hit by that, boom, you know, like I got even more excited. <laughs> Told her, told her all of that as well, you know. I couldn't, I couldn't hold back anymore, you know. And I fully unloaded all of my feelings, you know, onto her. And then, uh, this is real life. <laughs> she told me that she was already seeing someone and that we shouldn't see each other anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I can laugh about it now just because, you know, I know how I feel today, you know. So I went home and we stopped talking, you know, and I continued to think about my feelings and I reined it all in, you know, all, reined in all my thoughts and, you know, the whole I'm being crazy, obviously, you know, this isn't a Disney movie, you know, I'm not clairvoyant, I can't see the future. The universe is not taking care of me. This was all just a massive coincidence, you know? I'm just seeing patterns and I'm connecting the dots in reverse into my past, right? The universe does not have a plan for me, you know? I am not that special and I am not special at all, right? I am boring, you know? I'm only pretending to be interesting here. You know, I don't deserve to be happy. And I dealt with my feelings, you know, and thoughts, you know, and the psychologist in me grounded myself, you know, and I was still thinking that she might be the soulmate that I had been searching for my entire life. You know, it was still a maybe. So I remember January 2017, I made a New Year's resolution to be courageous, right? I decided to write her a letter uh, since I knew her apartment complex and I knew what her apartment number was. And I didn't think that was creepy or stalker behavior. I thought that was kind of like gray territory, but it was okay, you know, to send a letter, uh, just a letter explaining myself, you know, and telling her that she knows where to find me, you know, because I've been living in the same house for 20 years now. <laughs> and within the week, she was at my door again. And uh, she had broken up with whoever she was with uh, before Christmas. So not because of my letter or anything, she had broken up with the guy before and she wanted to Give me a chance. Woot. And we dated for about one month. 
very confusing, very confusing period for me. It was a month of me telling her how much I loved her and how much I admired her, that she was confident and brave and she was my inspiration to never give up this entire time. And without fail, every time, every single time I said something good and positive, she went drastically out of her way to prove me wrong and to turn it into a negative. Like, it felt like I let her into the purest room, you know, inside my heart. And she just started picking things up and smashing things for no reason. That's what it felt like. And I stuck by her for an entire month. And uh, then I slowly started to realize that I was ignoring, I was avoiding my problems because she was doing a terrible job at distracting me from them, you know? And I realized that I had a monster inside of me, you know, a very, very silent monster, completely still, you know, alive, breathing, but motionless, you know? I felt it very calm and very clear you know, not dangerous at all. You know, just darkness inside of me. You know, and uh, it, I considered it a monster born from the abuse that I suffered over my entire life, you know? And this is what I wanna call my shadow, right? I realized my shadow. And my shadow, to give it a personality, it told me, you're ignoring me, you know? And I knew at that moment that if I showed Kay anything of what was inside of me, you know, how I changed because of my past, it would harm her, you know? I just wanted to be happy with her and she wouldn't allow us to be happy, ever, you know? And I could feel how fragile and how frail she was, you know? And I did not want to break her. I did not want to hurt her at all, you know? It's like I spent my entire life looking for my soulmate, and this was the first time that I was looking at my own soul, right? Like, how can you know who your soulmate is if you don't know your own soul, you know? <laughs> You know, so uh, this awareness, it came over me at that moment. And uh, Kay, she started the breakup conversation. I knew it immediately that she was starting a breakup conversation. So I held up my hand, you know, and I said, I don't want to hear it. And I asked her, are you breaking up with me? She said, yes. I turned around, I left the apartment, and I have not seen her since. Like my mind, my heart, they both just went, I'm done, you know? And not just to her, I felt myself say that to the universe, like, I'm done with you, you know? Even after all of the romance, you know, the romances, romanticism, romanticism, you know, all of the synchronicity that I was talking about, like, how could this happen? There's chances of this happening, you know? Kay, she was still just a maybe to me. Maybe she is the one. You know? And it's, it's really funny, actually, because back in February of this year, uh, I wanted to tell this story specifically. And I remember I was standing in the kitchen and I was reaching for a bowl I was getting a bowl and I was really winding up to tell this story and I was I was immediately hit with this like tidal wave of jealousy but also of fear I felt fear as well from her who I was trying to tell the story to so I immediately changed my mind and I didn't tell the story 
and I really wish I would have at least told her the reason why I wanted to tell this story in the first place, you know? Because there's going to be some, not a twist, but a point to why I, was, I wanted to say it. But back to the story, you know? I, I know I formed a completion with K. I really did. And I immediately began my journey forward to learn more about myself. And I actually embraced the darkness that was inside of me. I didn't lose myself to it. I didn't go crazy with it, but I acknowledged it, you know? And uh, like I tried to learn from it. Uh, I tried to figure out if this darkness has always been inside of me or if it was a byproduct of my most recent abuse. I tried to figure out if, you know, if I was at my core, was I a bad person? You know, was I rotten? Was I broken? Did this abuse ruin me, you know? And most importantly, doubt. Uh, I started asking myself if nothing I felt was, or thought, was ever true. That, like, I had gotten myself so completely lost along the way, you know? And, uh, like, even, even though I was distraught, you know, I, I now know that I was healing at that time. You know, I was doing my shadow work, you know? Working on my shadow, working out my, my issues. So I went another level deeper into myself and really started looking at my soul with a magnifying glass, like really looking at specific things. Like I put myself into situations to see how I would react, like how my heart and my soul would react. Like I did pretty crazy things, you know? And I asked myself how I felt about it afterwards and I let pretty crazy things happen to me you know, and I asked myself how I felt afterwards, you know, and I slowly started escalating things to try to find my own personal boundaries, I guess, you know, the limitations, you know, testing my shadow and uh, like gauging how strong my monster inside was. And uh, I did this because I respected it and because I did not want to live in fear of it anymore, right? And the way I see it is I respected it and it's, it's a lot like respecting any weapon uh, that you're learning, you know, in order to not accidentally harm anyone with it. You respect it, you learn how to use it, and then you don't accidentally hurt people with it. That's the way I felt. That's the way I felt. So my mind was in the right place. And also, you can't figure out what to fix if you don't ever look at what's broken. If you don't ever look for where it's broken, you can't fix things, you know? So I thought I totally gave up my search for my soulmate during this period of my time. I was like, the romantic part of me is an idiot, you know? Drop this childish bullshit, fix yourself, take care of yourself. You don't need another person because I've never felt like I needed another person to, to complete me. I've always just wanted someone to share my life with, my experiences with, you know. But anyways, like uh, during this period, you know, like I, this period as in this month, August, I realized that I didn't, I didn't toss away me looking for my soulmate. I actually went full force into finding my soulmates, the exact opposite of what I thought I was telling myself. And uh, I was looking for the one that matched both my darkness and my light. You know, I was looking for my true soulmate, my twin flame. And up until this point, uh, all I was trying to do was match my light side with someone else's light side, you know? And I was doing my best to hide my dark side. 
you know, to fight it, to ignore it, to run from it. And uh, if, if spiritually you follow anything, it's kind of like the yin and the yang. You know, everyone is made out of light and dark. A lot of us try to strive to be only light, but you lose control of the dark if you, uh, if you ignore it, you know? So that's what I was trying to do. So winding it back, Renfest, end of 2017, in that darkness, you know, I met a tiny flame and like a tiny candle. And I took that candle and I held it to my soul with my magnifying glass to get a better look, you know? And slowly, very slowly, I started seeing a tiny flame in my soul. And I finally found the good in me. You're like, thank God, right? <laughs> I was worried that it was gone, you know? That it was snuffed out from the abuse or that it never existed in the first place. And it took me a while to realize that the flame I was holding and the flame that I was looking at was the same exact flame. So next episode will be the final episode of the series, A Day with D-Day, the final episode of A Day with D-Day. And I really wanted to say thank you to Kay and thank you to the universe for sending her my way to keep me safe all of those years, to give me the strength to never give up. You know, she always popped in to support me and then left when I was okay again. Like she really was my Valkyrie. And I truly feel that her job is complete. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you could hit the like button, please do. Uh, go ahead and subscribe and leave a comment. Tell me your opinions and your uh, experiences. Tell me your synchronicities in life, you know. Be romantic with me in the comments. Tell me you're about your, your perfect person. I want to hear good stories, you know, of people who have made it. Examples that I can hold on to. And uh, thank you so much. And remember, if you pray enough, you can change yourself into a cat person. <laughs> I love you guys, and I'll see you soon.